Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Fab Foundations, where we're going to take you from being a uh, knowing the rules player to a potentially advanced slash uh, competent player. So ha halfway decent. We're glad to have you here. Um, today we're talking about tempo, and. <laughs> Second time we've done it, actually. This is the second time we filmed it because it's such a tricky topic. Yeah, we filmed it once and we weren't really happy with the way that the, the concepts came across. So we think we've got some better analogies this time. And I think what we realized, and you see it in a lot of conversations about tempo and flesh and blood, there's kind of a, there's always a bit of a chuckle around it because I think traditional uh, players of traditional card games have a little bit different impression of what tempo is and it, it's expressed in a stranger way in flesh and blood, and so it's not really the same thing, but it's like such a familiar word that you use it. Um, so we'll give a little bit of background of tempo and then show you some examples of what it looks like in FAB and then how to reverse it with a move known as the pivot. <laughs> the pivot. The ultimate pivot, so, that's right. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the word tempo uh, it originates from older games. It does. I hear it mentioned in chess a lot. Yeah, I, I first learned about it in chess. Um, I was a, a enthusiastic amateur when I was in high school in chess, and I believe it came strictly from the musical idea of tempo. Right, you're you're mm. essentially speeding up. I, th uh, I think you meant a literal musical. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> what? Tempo. Yeah. Um, Rant or something. And and what it is in chess is it's actually a unit of measure. It actually happens, you don't have tempo, you're gaining tempo move by move. Mm. Um, so you can literally gain a tempo, is what they call it. And what that usually means, and I think this is a really good definition going into a conversation about tempo, is it's this idea that you're improving your position, particularly in a way that forces your opponent to not improve theirs. Okay. Kind of frankly. So a lot of times what that, what that looks like in chess is, chess is a game about developing pieces and developing, uh, you know, your lines of play. Your positions. Exactly, yeah, so your literal positions. So if huh. you advance like this knight, or let, the bishop is usually a, a pretty common uh, piece here, you advance this bishop and it's shooting a straight line at their king, you put them in check. And yeah. check is generally where you're gonna find those gaining tempo plays. Yeah. And then your opponent, rather than developing their offense, they have to actually take a piece and like move it in a way that maybe they didn't want to. Yeah to cover up what you've just threatened. So your piece remains advanced and improved, and now you have them on the defense that now this piece, if they ever move it again, your king's uh, gonna get checkmated, right? Yeah, so the basic there is, in just simple terms, if you put my king in check, my only move is to move my king. Move your king or cover up the check line, yeah. The only moving the king is really bad. It's usually bad. Cause like, yeah. and sometimes you can actually advance your position by blocking Mm -hmm. that piece in chess. And that happens a lot. Yeah, and that's important, Yeah, right? And so I think you see there's a lot of similarities in any game when it talks mm -hmm. about, uh, when you think about tempo and, and the structure of the way that these games work. In Fab, same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there are moves you can make that position you, that prevent your opponent from advancing their position while also positioning you better. Right. But there's some really critical differences. Yeah, it's different in, in that in-between state between chess and flesh and blood is games like Magic or like all the games that we've kind of grown up with in the collectible space mm -hmm. or in the, the, you know, the card game space usually revolves around there's a certain number of finite resources every turn. And if you use less resources doing the thing that your opponent's doing or taking the thing away that they just did, then you're gaining tempo over the course of the game. Like we do this in Ashes all the time. Constantly. If you don't know about Ashes, so it's a there's ten dice every turn and it's a resource base. So your your ten dice, your resources. Zach, a lot of the time, I'll play like a three dice thing. I'll spend three resources on a thing, put it on the table, boom, pass the turn over to you. You better do something. He might spend one dice to destroy it or to move it off the table. Yeah, and that is, I, I basically gain two dice of tempo, two yeah. units of tempo. So you're two ahead at that point, Yeah, right? and I think the key difference with Flesh and Blood, and it really crystallized even as we were having this conversation, mm -hmm. is one of those things we mentioned really early, if you watch a lot of our early Flesh and Blood streams, reasons with this game is interesting and different, in that you actually end a game weaker than you started it. Yeah. And so throughout the game, you'll have your equipment, right? It'll get worse, it'll maybe be destroyed, like my Crater Fist here, block twice with it, and then it goes away. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you'll pitch blue cards as resources a lot early, so by the end of the game, you're drawing into a bunch of blues, which are weaker cards. And so there's that component mixed with the fact that this is not a game where you build a board state. 
So in Magic or the Spoils or Ashes, you're actually building a board. And right. so when you make a tempo exchange, right, when you gain tempo in those games, there's a literal difference in what I have available to me on the board versus right. you, just like chess. If I tempo you, I'm better positioned. It also means I have better pieces and better options available mm-hmm. until eventually I have such an advantage that I can pen your king and you can't do anything about yeah, it. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the key pieces that is not the case in Flesh and Blood that winning tempo in this moment does not necessarily make it easier for me to win it later. In the Ashes example, if you have two more dice worth of stuff, now you have two more dice worth of capability that I now can't get around, and so you winning another die in that exchange or another die in that exchange becomes easier and easier, same with chess. Yeah, and a lot of times the, those incremental advantages spiral out into bigger advantages. Yeah, they just keep growing yeah. over time. You felt that in a bunch of games, Yeah, right? once you're three pieces ahead in chess, mm-hmm. right, it's way easier to take a piece. And, and then that fourth piece is going to make it easier to take the fifth piece and so on and so forth. And honestly, that's why when you're playing a lot of games, if you're really savvy and you kind of understand the gameplay, but about halfway in, you might realize, I'm, I've am i lost. But you sit there and have to just take a beating for the next half of the game. <laughs> yeah. And that's one of the more that's exhilarating... That's right? it, Absolutely. That's one of the more exhilarating things about Flesh and Blood is that I might make a bunch of bad exchanges up front, but it doesn't mean that the fifth turn, I can't make great exchanges and kind of win back. Because sure. the only thing that you and I are betting on, as we talked about, is our health. Yeah, and there's there's a mild, like a the secondary resource of cards. Yeah. You're, you're spending cards. Mm-hmm. So the things you're losing that you can't get back are your armor pieces, if they go away, mm-hmm. your cards, and your health. Yeah. And so it, it actually, it, literally this morning, kind of <laughs> just crystallized for me, <laughs> which is why I like this game so much. Uh, one classic game that I like a lot is poker. Yeah. All forms of poker. And really, it was the recognition, kind of an analogy to explain why tempo is relevant in this game. Because in a lot of games, it works just like chess. I take some pieces more yep. efficiently than you. Yep. I build my board. I create an in- incremental advantage, and I win the game. But in this game, it reminds me way more of playing poker hands. You draw your hand, and then every hand, you get the opportunity to bet. Yep. You can fold, which looks a lot like just blocking out with your hand. Yeah, that's right. I don't like this hand. I don't like what's going on. I'm just going to not take damage, and I'm going to try again next time. Mm-hmm. And then the hands you bet on are the hands that you decide to not block, yeah. right? A certain amount. And how much you're willing to bet, right? <laughs> how many chips you're putting in the table you're is betting health. how many yeah. cards you're putting in. It's crazy. And the, the fundamental reality of tempo is that if I lose health, I, there are cards that gain you health back. But in general, if I lose health, I can't get it back. Mm-hmm. If I use cards, I can't get those back. Very specific things I have to do to get those back. Yeah. And so if you hit me for 10, and I allow it to happen because I'm betting on my hand, mm-hmm. it's, it's particularly obvious and sealed. We've been playing a lot of sealed lately. Super obvious, yeah. It's a good format. But I take 10, let's say because I can swing for 15 back. And maybe I swing for 15 black, and you can block all 15 somehow. Mm-hmm. Well, what just happened is <laughs> I lost 10 health. I made a bad bet, right? I put my chips in. I failed. And now I better hope. Because let's say you used your whole hand to block that. Yeah. I better hope that the hand I now draw is the hand that I'm willing to bet on again. Yeah, is as good or better. You're now like big blind on that on that situation yeah. where it's like now the pressure is on. You have to keep it up. Or because once you once you bottom out, that's when we kind of calculate the score, right? Yeah. Because like you took ten, and then if over the course of you doing that, you don't do at least ten before I take it back over then you've lost that exchange. So that might be many turns, yeah. but it can it can uh, calculate out eventually. And unless you're doing something that forces your opponent to block as well, you have to be careful. And that's where I get to the conversation of who would win if no one's blocking. Because mm-hmm. uh, you might take 10 to s- swing 15 back. They take it, but then now they can swing and kill you back. Yeah. And it's like you, there's a, a lot of variables going on here. But the reality, which is what you were mentioning earlier about tempo that's so crazy about this game, is that just because... I win a, an exchange mm-hmm. doesn't mean I win the game. Like, you can be down to one health in Flesh and Blood, and they're, they're at 40, and you can still win that game. Absolutely. Same in poker. You can get down to 10 chips, right, from one chip. You have to go all in, you win the hand. You have to go all in, you win the hand. Yeah. And slowly, you can buy your way back into the game, basically. There's no lead too big, either, in Flesh and Blood that you can ever... Like, it, it, if we got to chess, and I'm down to a king pawn... Against, like, my seven piece. You have seven pieces? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Th- there's right? no... <laughs> technically a way? I mean, you, you you could play it poorly enough technically. Yeah. 
But if you're doing anything at all, it's going to be almost impossible for you to lose that game. Um, and that's what we talk about in like Ashes, same thing. Like there, There's ways to play Ashes where at, at some point the game's not over, but there's no way you're going to win. Yeah, that's right. Like You get to that moment. It's a, and it's good. I think the analogy with poker is really good, um, and that kind of revolutionizes the way that you might think about every hand. That not every hand has to be your best hand. Mm-hmm. I mean, sometimes every player is going to have hands that are just less good than others in terms of their attacking capability or their defending capability. We affectionately call those potatoes. Those are the potatoes, right? Uh, and so, really, both players are trying to improve their position, and in so doing, you know, gain tempo on their opponent, but. What you're really doing is you're gaining the capability to make those bets later in the game. Mm. So the more I block early, I'm just waiting until I feel like I can wager my 20 health to, to do 30 back and then just start swinging and start going. That's why a lot of times we call it momentum uh, in flesh and blood. It's, it's a common term as well, is that there's usually one player that is on offense. And that secondary player is the one that is blocking, waiting for their time, waiting to turn the table, and then eventually they become the offensive player through a pivot, and then you're on the defense again and you're waiting, and there's kind of this beautiful back and forth pull to it. So when we say a player has tempo, they might be behind in health, Mm -hmm. they might have made some bad exchanges up front, they might not have made all of the best tempo-based exchanges in a traditional sense, but if they're the one that is getting their opponent to block and forcing the issue and, and rolling out on offense, then they do have tempo at the time. That's why we talk about yeah. it like that. And there's there's tons of games where I have less cards and less health and less equipment, but I have tempo. Yeah. And we're in a position, and you see this a lot. Um, you know, it's technically happening earlier, but it's very obvious when you get down to lethal health. Mm-hmm. So when you're under 10, usually, if any given hand might threaten to actually kill your opponent, and that is usually what is the now you have to block yeah. moment. And there are other things that put you in a may as well block or really should be blocking this, right? So there's hand, let's say you have a hand that can only attack for four. Right. Like that's the best you can do. Your opponent sends 10 at you. So your options are like, use your whole hand to block 10 or swing back, take 10 and swing four. That's a moment where it's like, it makes more sense to be blocking. Yeah. Just just logically speaking. But there's very little in the game that actually forces your opponent to block. Mm -hmm. Now you want to present situations that if they don't block, it gets out of hand. Just the value is so good for you. Yeah. And that's where that's where a lot of those interesting exchanges happen. So let, let's actually show some, some examples here. Um, we've got a couple of heroes that play, you know, every hero plays the game a little differently, quite a bit differently, in fact, even though it's really fundamentally the same game. Um, so I've got Bolton here, one of my favorites here recently in Constructed. Zach's got Bravo. He's been playing Bravo for all of his life uh, from the beginning. And these two heroes demonstrate something. Uh, they demonstrate the same concept in a different way. Um, so let's just say we're both at 40 health. And Zach, I'm just going to, this is like the hand that I really want to demonstrate. So I'm okay. just going to get a, a random hand A rando here. hand. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to uh, attack you. And then you're going to make a decision on whether or not you want to try to gain tempo or not, right. as if we let's were playing it. a real game. Um, so I'm bold. let's say we're both at 40. Let's say we started the game. You're the first player. You got an arsenal, and then here I come I back. I see that in. tunic's already loaded up. Yeah, right. Well, you know, you got you to have that tunic on. <laughs> let's just leave it at two. You're good. Uh, it's fine. Um, all right, so how about this? How about we pitch, play a take flight. We're going to charge our soul here. And this is a yellow take flight? Yeah. All right. uh, and it's just three damage coming at you, uh, and then it is going to have go again. So in your head, you're thinking, I'm going to take, I can take three, and then I've got three more coming in from Raiden. There could be one more, but probably nine. He's probably going to put this card in the arsenal because he's a good, good flesh and blood. Player. <laughs> so, so you have the option to block or not block. And I'm going to go ahead and just uh, flip my hand over. Okay. Just so it can be seen. I got the classic Bravo Blues here. Right. Yeah, you got tons um, of blues. So in. we did the attacking blocking video, and. In that math, right, just hypothetically speaking, something I know I can do here, you're coming coming in for three. Um, you have charge, so Bolton's ability is technically online. So for me to block that fully, right, uh, let's say I block with these two cards, blocking for six. Yeah. I, I have that choice to do that. Yeah. Right? So then let's just carry on the turn. All right, you block uh, for six. Just assume that's what happens. I'm going to swing Raiden for three. All right, so now I, I have this uh, non-attack. So right. I could I could block with it for three. You won't get a bonus. All right, you covered it up. So in that in that case, I take no damage. I did use three cards. Mm-hmm. That's I will eventually run out of cards if I keep doing that. Uh, and in this exact example, right now, all observers would say Bolton has tempo here. 
I just launch an attack at you. Yep. You blocked with a bunch of cards. Now I get a fresh hand that I don't, you know, who knows what this hand's going to be. And I'm operating on one card plus an arsenal. You got one card and an arsenal. Yeah, that's so right. in this particular example, right, and we'll run it back in a second. I want to see it again. Uh, let's say I swing my Anothos. Cost me three. I pitch. Swing for four. And swing for four. Okay. So I, well, stop six, and I, I'm swinging for four. So I've got this hand. I've got a number of attacks. I can't play all of these attacks on a single hand. They don't have go again naturally. Mm -hmm. So like I'm looking at this and saying, there's really no reason not to block with at least two of these attacks, depending on what's in my arsenal. I want Plunder Run to end up there. I can play that Bolt of Courage. I want a card to charge. So this card in this hand is completely worthless to me. Yep. So I can go ahead and block three, take one. And that's important to, to note in that attacking blocking conversation. It's just the recognition that there are hands your opponent can't do anything but block with. Yep. And in that case, me getting rid of that card out of your hand didn't do anything. It actually didn't do anything. Now, there is a long clock of the game, which eventually we'll get to, where the fatigue win condition, these kinds of things are more a consideration of improving your position. Um, but right now, it's not terribly important. So then I come back at you. I swing that Bolt of Courage. I charge again. And Bolton's an interesting hero because he's kind of building this long mm -hmm. soul base, like, I'm going to take tempo from you at some point if you allow me to because I've got this soul that's charging up. Yeah, and it, it, you are incrementally getting there, right? You're out of mm -hmm. your soul, you put an arsenal, your tunic would be clicking up. Um, and But then we see here, this is a three damage attack with no go again. I'm not going to be able to swing the sword. I've got one card in my hand. Yes. And to swing the sword, you would have to... You could, with Bolton's ability, lose a soul. I could if you only could oh, block yeah, it. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So it's like, oh, it's So in this case, nine. let's just say I take it. No, I do happen to have a plus three. Oh, get out of town. OK, so I'll take <laughs> six, six. I see, I see. It's supposed to be a nice, clean game. That's Here right, and that goes away, and that goes So away. then that's actually perfect. You, you got six damage in, right? If yeah. You look at, if you look at that exchange, right? You didn't get any cards out of my hand. Right. But you did score six damage. You loaded your soul, and you got plunder on your arsenal. That's right. So these are relevant factors, right? Yeah. But um, every casual observer knows now. Zach has, is right now trying to make a pivot. You kept a five card hand. You took three plus three, six damage to the face, basically. You thought only three, but sometimes that happens. And now you're holding on to a five card hand. And so the question sure for you now is, can you do anything better than the six damage that you just took? You just bet that six health on whatever you're well, about to do. let's see if I can. I have a feeling I can. I'm just going to get my uh, card ready here. OK, so over to me. I'm going to use my tectonic plating. I'm going to pitch one to create this uh, seismic surge token, which will give me a discount later on a guardian. Of course, tank. yeah. Don't want to get too lost in the weeds here. Uh, then let's say I pay two, and we'll trigger Bravo's ability. Now, Bravo's ability says, until the end of turn, attack action cards I control with a cost three or greater gain dominate. Go Interesting. Again. So I do that, and I got to keep going. Yeah. So I don't even have the option to block this very well. Yeah. So then I'm going to pay seven for a card called Crippling Crush. And this is an 11 damage attack, has dominate thanks to Bravo's ability. And it says, if Crippling Crush deals four or more damage to a hero, they discard two random cards. So 11, you can block with a single card. Amazing. Right? So this is an example of a control effect, a discard effect, that forces a pivot to happen. So if I choose to block none of these, I still lose two cards. And so, 11 health. And 11 health. So like, that is hugely bad for me. You took six, yeah. I take 11, and I also lose two cards. So at that point, you become the uh, the offensive player there. Like you're now in control of the tempo of the game. Mm -hmm. You're calling the shots. So let's see what it looks like. I know I'm losing two cards anyway. Um, I'll just block three. I'll take nine here, hey. and, and then I'll discard oh, eight. Yeah. <laughs> I played this game well. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we never said you were good at math. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm just here to talk. I'm the talking guy. <laughs> and then I discard two cards. Let's say uh, yeah. here. And now I'm coming back with a one-card hand that can't actually do anything. Even though you have that plunder right in our soul. And it's like, ah, well, OK, I'll, I'll do that. Now, now show me that hand again. I want to demonstrate how this can go wrong. This is an arsenal. So in that case, you just pivoted and took tempo from me, mm -hmm. which was very beautiful. We, uh, we, loved, we loved it. Now We like the style. Check this out. Let me get one of these guys, show the other way that this can look. Mm -hmm. OK, so you take six damage. I arsenal a card. And now you come in with a Crippling Crush for 11. OK, well, let's see. Um, what if I do a Soul Shield Defense Reaction from Arsenal, which doesn't count for Dominate, cover up six of that, and then also sink the low for four from hand. So now I take the one damage, so I actually go back up. I take one damage. 
I gain a card in my soul. Seems good. I can sink below to filter my hand if I want to. Let's just go ahead and do that, you know? Sink this below. And then, uh, all right, end of the turn. I took one. You took six. I took one. That's a very good exchange for you. You've got four cards. I've only got two. So let's see what happens if we keep it going. Mm -hmm. Now I do a take flight. Let's say, in fact, let's say we have the tunic. This often happens. I'll do a take flight, charge my soul here off of the tunic. So now I'm coming back at you for four. Now this is where we really calculate the score, right? Mm -hmm. You've taken six. I've taken one. Now, if you take any amount of damage here, if you, if I get back in the driver's seat, if you block with two to three cards, then we can kind of call it clean. I've won five health in this series of exchanges. But the cool thing is nothing really on the board has shifted to make the future of our exchanges more likely to favor you or me. That's right. And that's, I think, the absolutely fascinating thing about Flesh and Blood. Yeah, because, I mean, there's, there's little things. Like, you have more cards than soul. I have a surge token. There's little things that are happening mm -hmm. here. But you're totally right. Like, even here, let's say I just take four, right? Yeah. So and now you're up. Swing three. And let's say I take three. Yeah, take three. All right. So that's an amazing exchange for Tremendous, you. Tremendous, right? Yeah. And so then you but, didn't block, but now you've got tempo. Because right. you're now the player who's basically bet your health. Again, you've bet seven health on this hand. And, and now what are you going to do in response? And right? I think that's what's so interesting about tempo and fab. I'm not currently winning. No. But I have tempo. You do have it. So, like, yeah. <laughs> let's look that, at that. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, let's like, look at that. Even here, now I will get a, a slap back, right? And, and there's two versions of this, which is having tempo is great if you're capable of slapping back. Yeah. Hit me right. with that crippling crush again. So, show, show me that. <laughs> here we go. We're let's, back in. Let's see two versions of this, right? Yeah. So, usually, crippling crush does exactly this. It's like, oh, I'm going to lose my hand anyway. It doesn't matter. I'm going to block three. Let's just say we started at 40. I'm going to block three. Let's say I lose these two, and then it comes back to me, and it's like, all right, so I've taken eight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's two more cards. And then I get a card in Arsenal. So I've just taken eight damage. I send nothing back, and you now have a four-card hand free of charge. Yeah. So th that is, a, that is the, the textbook pivot for you. But what's crazy is that, as you can tell, from the same looking hand, you had a card in Arsenal and a full hand, right? Yeah. Sometimes Crippling Crush dominated results in this. Which Absolutely. Which is health incremental difference. They lose the cards. It's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they have a soul shield in Arsenal. And right. a, a, even just to defend with something from your hand or a defense reaction, you take one and you still swing back. Yeah. And that's when you think about poker hands, right? If you look and you have a pair of aces in, in the pocket, right? Mm -hmm. When you have Crippling Crush with Dominate ready to go, that in poker is always, you know, this is the odds of this working, right? Yeah. But like, what are the odds of you having a defense reaction in Arsenal? Good question. Right? And like, did and, I plan for it? And who, <laughs> anyways. And then what you'll also see players do, I've seen you talk about this a lot, is like, oh, I've got the Crippling Crest this time. It's like, I just took 22 damage so that I could launch this 11 damage Crippling Crush. Yeah. And it's like, that's true. Like, you can take 22 damage to pivot and be the tempo player, but your reign as the tempo player has got to be delivering greater than 22 damage back to me over the course until I take it back from that's you. That's right, and I think that's where you get into some more poker analogies, right? If I'm up 15 health, I can take 22 right. to slam that attack. Right. You can make that bet, you have the chips to do it, right? But when it's close, or it's early, and that's the longer you, you know, longer you play Bravo, particularly the more blues get in your deck and the more defensive you get, Mm -hmm. because your opponent starts to understand the lines that are coming. And it's like, you're either going to have a dominated Spinal Crush or Crippling Crush, and I want to be able to block that. Yeah. So they'll start consistently putting defense reacts there, they'll use their armor on those particular moments, and they'll find ways around it, because if they can, they know uh, if you if you save up, because it's a seven-cost card, mm -hmm. and to, to pay for dominate, you have to save at least three cards, typically. Otherwise, you can't even swing. And so, like, they can pressure you, and if you don't block and you do that, they, they can if they can dance around it. And they kind of know. You just win. It's crazy how quick you can win, win the exchange. Game. So let's take a look at what happens. So let's say you've gained tempo here. So yeah. you've pivoted with a big old crippling crush. Now you've got a, now this is, you've got a blind four card hand. Yeah. So there's two things that can happen here. Let's the, see one thing the that can happen. This is the first thing. Let's see one thing. And to be clear, like the crippling crush hitting and or even 
when it didn't, you just hit me back for four, mm-hmm. right? And I still have this four card hand. So I there's having the tempo, one version of that where I was getting ahead and one where I was losing. Right. Both result in this moment still happening. Not that this is any like particularly crazy kind of moment, but uh, it's just important to know that the same line can can work out a lot of different can ways. Can work it, it and just like in poker, your next hand is going to be your next hand no matter what you do. Right. How many chips you have to bet when you have that hand is is the key. That really is the key. Yeah. So start of my turn, the seismic sarge uh, destroys itself. My first guardian attack costs minus one. I'm going to play a zealous belting, mm. pitching a blue debilitate, mm. which means the zealous belting is going to have go again. So it's five damage coming at you, uh, and it has go again, which means I'll get to do something after that. Awful. Okay, so I know it's go again. I know you have another attack. I'm looking at this hand, and I'm saying... Oh no, like he's got this follow up. This is like great. Uh, so I'm just going to block it out. <laughs> I'm scared. Uh, so I'll block with six here. Yeah. And now there's, t- there's two two options here, right? And this is, there's so much nuance in the game. But I could swing this, the hammer. Mm-hmm. I could I could pay one, create a Sarge, pay three, swing a hammer for six. You already you only have two cards left. So the value of my other card that I'm about to play just to show it uh, is less because you just have less going on. But uh, my first guardian attacks minus one from seismic. I have one resource floating. So I'm going to pay four for a spinal crush. Mm. It's coming in for nine damage. And if it deals at least four, you basically lose go again. It's beautiful. Yeah. So I was thinking, well, I've got three cards here. So maybe, you know, you have a four card hand, you dump it all. If I can have three cards that I have a command and conquer, it's like I can get really back in this. You didn't play an arsenal card, and now you're hitting me with something that takes away my biggest offensive power, which is going again and yeah. doing multiple things. Um, so I kind of have no choice but to block this for six, take three more. Haven't been tracking this well, but take three more. And now you've got another three on the tempo that you've won from the original Crippling Crush. Yep. I draw back up, and, and I get try a, to do it again. I get another full turn. That's and right. This is where I want to show the next thing that happens. Show me the next thing that happens. Uh, so just like in poker, you can have... A lot of momentum, you're gaining chips, you're having great hands, you're playing it just like you're supposed to. Sometimes you get that 2-7 in the pocket, yeah. right? You get the, the bad hand. So I'm going to flip my hand over here. And what I have is all blue attacks. Mm-hmm. Uh, my most threatening one is this disable. It can swing for 7. If it has 4 or more, your arsenal card goes onto your deck. That's not bad. Mm-hmm. So I could create a surge token. I could swing the attack. I could get dominate and swing the attack. Um, what I'm going to do, uh, just a classic example, I'm going to use the tectonic plane to create another seismic surge. Then I'm going to... Give you two money there. Yeah. Then I'm going to pay three and swing Anothos. It's going to attack you for six. It's going to leave two cards in my hand so I can put one in Arsenal. Right on. But the same four-card hand resulting in uh, nine less damage. Not ideal. Then last turn, right? So that then, as the non-tempo player... I say, so you're saying I only have to bet six health to get back on top of this game, to pivot this turn around. That's right. Um, so it's a sinking feeling in Bravo land. I, I, think, I think I'll just take six, right? There's no threatening hit effects. I don't get cards. You don't take anything nasty. So then I go to end my turn. I want to put a card in Arsenal and then pass it back over to you. So let me show you then what, like... A Bolton player might pivot. What that might look like. So it's different. It's different. I can actually do it with this hand, but I've got a nicer one set up. <laughs> um, anytime plunder runs an arsenal, you're like, okay, here we go. Yeah. Let's assume this is here. It's different for different heroes. How, how you pivot, and, and for some heroes, like how you pivot at all. Like you know, the old hymns and stuff. Maybe it's a, it's not quite as much of a I need to be on top of the game. Maybe it's more about I need to block and get to the end of this game. But for the majority of heroes, it's about when is it the right time for me to take tempo over. And so you have to say it's a combination of when is the bet low enough that I feel confident that it's a good bet, and then when is my hand good enough when the bet is low enough to actually take that bet, yeah. right? So I sometimes you have a really great hand, so you might be willing to bet a little bit more health. I'll take 9 to send this back, or I'll take 10 to send this back. Or a lot of times they're at 12 health. I'll take 15 to send 12 back. Yeah. And now that I know they've got to block that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but a hero like Bolton does stuff like this. So let's say we use our Tunic resource. We play V the Vanguard out of our arsenal. Let's say we charge two cards. It's always a good start. Yeah, so I've taken six damage to do this. So then you've got a five damage attack coming at you. And if I block with an attack 
It gets plus one. It gets plus one. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to block with an attack. And so you're thinking, and you're seeing via the vent. This is like when your opponent is saying, like, I'm all in. Like, that you know that these are one of the, one of Bolton's strongest cards. You know it's a five card hand. You know I just took six and didn't block. So you're saying, is my hand worth betting higher than what the Bolton player is just willing to bet? Are you going to call me on this, or are you going to fold? Yeah, and I think that's where, like, if I reveal my hand, right? The uh, you have to look at the options, and mm -hmm. you also have to look at, and this is tempo is relevant to the score of the game. How many yeah. cards are left? Are we at the end of our deck? Uh, but I'm looking at currently according to our scores. <laughs> you have 23 <laughs> and I have 28, so yeah, whatever sure. that's worth. Uh, so I, and I have this blue disabled that we tucked. Great card uh, had down there. No. Here, yeah. <laughs> so technically, you know, I have eight resources here, and I could I could play like a disable with a pummel. So I could do 11 with two really great hit effects. Yeah, pummel's a great hit effect. Yeah. Disable yeah. is even mm -hmm. in a, with the pummel. That's that's going to maybe surprise you, and I get both of those hit effects. You didn't expect it. Maybe. Why don't you try to do that? Um, what do you say? Why don't you try to do that? Well, that's that's my my brain naturally. Yeah. Like, yeah I do that. But um, the other thing I'm looking at is all your attacks are plus two. Mm -hmm. That means you're going to probably give this go again with your ability. Then Raiden's going to come in for five, okay? And then you have two cards in hand, so like that makes me think like... There's a bet there. There's probably at least one more attack coming. So I have to look at the score and, and say... Um, and, you know, a lot of times you won't block that you need to block, but I'm probably taking at least 15. Mm -hmm. uh, luckily, I have 28 health, so I can take 15. Um, at this point, you're not threatening any hit effects. So I'm just going to pass, and I'll take the damage. All right, so you take five. I assume you give a go again before I take one. Yeah, absolutely. The old, I'll absolutely the old, the old, do that. The old Bolton uh, trap right there. The old there. Bolton constructed loss uh, yeah. scenario there. It's like forgetting to use your Snapdragon or something. Yeah, crazy. Wouldn't that be awful? Then we got Raiden coming in for five, as you predicted. Yep. Uh, still non-threatening. You're uh, kind of pot committed at this point, as so you might say. I'm just yeah. going to pass and take take the five. All right, so I'll give it a go again. And then this is where, this is where as a player uh, that has made this bet, it's that nervousness, that that moment of like excitement okay <laughs> sometimes these cards actually are nothing yeah they do very little um and that you know you can bluff in the game right and where it forced them to block all of this out and you're like oh these are potatoes mm -hmm. are some one of these um but sometimes like i'm just rolling in for nine so on a bolting blade yellow bolting blade yeah the cost is zero because you charge twice yeah so now you have to ask like okay i've already kind of committed to mm. pivoting my turn back into this game with this pummel disable play is it still worth it because a lot of times you get three bets in you know on a poker hand and yeah. it's like eh, it's well, time to fold at this point too like the it's the classic sunk cost fallacy so like we can erase what i did here and i have to re-examine re the situation you're mm -hmm. coming at me for nine i have 18 health left mm -hmm. for like, hopefully you don't have another one of these in your hand crazy that'd right? be insane uh but i still i i in this position um because you still have a card left, right? Mm -hmm. So probably I'm starting to look at what can I, and if I block here at plus one, so that gets even and worse. Like earlier I could have done a like block with Showtime, block with Pummel mm -hmm. to cover up five and don't give you plus one. Um, and I can still cover up five yeah. and take four. Uh, but then what can I do with my hand? And this is the, the Bravo magic, right? Yeah, and what you're thinking right now is like if you block this, if you start to block this, you're, you've lost tempo. Mm -hmm. I have it successfully pivoted, and now my next four-card hand is coming up against your next four-card hand, and I'm the tempo player at that point. Yeah, and it's it's likely in my mind that the thing in your hand is either something you want in Arsenal or a zero-cost card that you want to play, which mm -hmm. could be a Bolting Blade in this case. Mm -hmm. It could also be like uh, the zero for three that draws a card yeah. when it hits, yeah. which would, would still be bad for me uh, because you draw and put it in Arsenal and like... That's a thing. So just extra value. Let's just let's just say I don't block. Yeah, stick with the plan. Let's just you're gonna come back I'm, on the. Pivot. I'm committed, so I'm gonna take nine. All right, take a nine. I assume you're going again. Let's go again. Yeah, unload that soul. Oh, we can't. This doesn't have go again. We it's not even. Oh, it is higher. Yeah, be a brain. Yeah, yeah, that be yeah, the that's vanguard. Works. I've only done that work. a million times. And then we do have another bolting blade oh, for nine. Get out of now, town. Now that's why it's irrelevant because now. You don't have a choice anymore. And this is the point when tempo becomes very different. You're on the one chip table spot right now, where now you could have been holding on. You needed all five cards to successfully pivot, but your opponent has now put you in a position where you have to lose one card no matter what or die. Yeah. And so now your entire turn 
could have been for nothing. So this was a terrible bet. Yeah, and the moment, as an example, that I block with anything, let's say I block here, I can no longer disable and pummel. Mm -hmm. So I may as well block here. Right. Uh, and this lets me still swing the hammer. Technically, I could swing the hammer with just the blue, um, which is worth considering. Blocking the yellow disable is interesting, though, because I block for three, but it gives you plus one. Yeah. So it's a two block. So it's basically. really a two block, yeah. which is fine. It's more than zero, technically. Yeah. So let's say I now am in a horrible position. I block for eight. And you block for eight. This goes up to 10 because of the plus one. So I take so then two. You take two. And now I'm down to seven. And now this is what Zach and I really wanted to show is. So at this point, like you know, you can take the beating. I took the the six damage or the eight damage, to then return a ton of damage, and then you were like, "It's fine because I've got the health to bet on this. I've got the health to lose." And then it turned out it was a bigger bet than you were expecting. And this is the beauty of card games. We don't know what's in our opponent's hands, but now what position that puts me in is I can actually make bigger bets, and still do proportionally more damage to remain the tempo player, proportionally more value, I should say, to remain the tempo player. Yeah. So I could take 13 to threaten 8. Yeah. And that's still probably good for me. I could take, you know, I could potentially take 20 to threaten 20 back. That's right. And, and because the health totals, it actually is a better play than it would be earlier in the game. And when you get on these low health totals, right, it forces tempo. Because yeah. now anytime you can swing for 7, I must block. And swinging for any, because every damage I take now is going to get me make your threshold lower every turn that you need to do to force cards out of my hand. That's right. And as you force cards out of my hand, obviously my offense is likely to be less powerful, mm -hmm. which then means you keep more cards and you can threaten more damage. And it's this spiral that happens yep. that I can't really ever get out of. And that's and that's an easy way to think about who the tempo player is or who the beatdown player is or who has momentum in flesh and blood is essentially who's doing the blocking in this exchange. Because there are also times whenever I might present 12, you block it all. I present 12, you block it all. I present 12, you block it all. I'm the tempo player, but I'm not improving my position. Yeah. And then one time I'll draw and it's like, oh, I can only do five. You block it and then you swing back for eight. And now it's like, we switched. I can either take eight health and keep doing the exchanges, or I can block all of that. And now you're the tempo player swinging, swinging, swinging. Yeah. I block, I block, I block. Yeah. Which and, is, and that's yeah. the fundamental rhythm of the game. And I think that hints at why those breakpoints we talked about last time are so critical. Because mm -hmm. it's my one card, you're having to spend that extra card typically, right? Yeah. Everything's at, on average blocking for three. That's why seven is, and a four and a 10 are important, uh, is that you're trying to pressure those cards out of hand or force damage through, right? They That's call right. it leaking damage. Mm -hmm. When you're just, I'm blocking with most of my hand, you're taking, you're doing one or two, I'm not really doing much back until I'm willing to take a little more to try to actually get in there. Like, that's a perfect pivot turn. Absolutely. That is the, Bolton wants to build to that moment. Yep. And then when he has that moment, uh, your opponent, uh, there's almost no hand in the game that this would be a positive exchange for defensively. Right, like, right. You're just getting railroaded. That That's the, <laughs> what we've seen here is two different approaches to how a pivot works. And sometimes, it's an optional pivot where I can choose to block or not. And sometimes, in this, in the case of dominate, cripple, and crush, it's a it's a necessary pivot. It's a forced issue. I'm, lose, I'm losing the cards <laughs> unless I have those defense reactions yeah. tucked. And so you'll you'll find heroes like Bravo that have the capability of setting up those kinds of plays. And then you'll find other heroes like Bolton, where it's like, listen, I don't need to pivot. If you're willing to take 25 damage and then stay in the driver's seat, I'll keep blocking after that. Yeah. And then if you take another 20 damage, it's like, now, because I've done so much damage over the course of a couple of turns of the game, you can no longer have the option to not block. Yeah. So high offense decks that are just putting raw numbers up, like the Via and Bolton, they're just wanting to have occasional turns where they do a ton of damage, and if you take it all, great, that's fine. Yep. We, don't, we don't need to pivot, we'll just take the damage, and we'll go back in our shell for a while. And there are some heroes that like to take tempo, uh, like Katsu is a good example of this, likes to take tempo and beat you down in, where you never get back in the game. Yeah. Once you give it up, like if you block, you can't possibly block everything and return fire. So like to do it like that. Some decks like to, like Bravo, be a little defensive, take tempo for a while, beat down for a couple of turns, and then seed it back. Yeah. Um, there's a ton of different approaches to how this works, but the fundamental dance of the game is one player is on offense, and then there are a number of strategies to either stay there or to make that offense big enough that even if you lose it later, you've gained so much advantage during that time that you'll ultimately win the game. That's right. 
Any final thoughts on uh, tempo, man? It's a, it's a wily, wily topic in, in Flesh and Blood particularly, but I think the more you play, the more you start to feel the tempo of yeah. the game happening. And it's, it's so important to understand how your deck interacts with tempo and how what you're trying to set up. You see this turn with Bolton, and you start realizing why he'll block out so much. Right. Is that until he has this turn, that 10 damage is not worth betting. Right. Like, he, well, he <laughs> these hands are not know, worth betting He, he needs yeah. a flush or better before he's he's betting. Uh, and some heroes, like even the, the recent Lightning Briar decks, right? It's like consistently just kind of a straight. It's like yep, just, just, just slapping it with a straight, hands out, making it yeah. hard to win chips. Uh, and so you kind of have to know. Uh, <laughs> I was gonna say no one to hold no one. To hold, but <laughs> I mean, really, it really is that thing. If you uh, think about the game that way, I think it's really helpful. Yeah, every hand and just understanding, and you see it all the time in Seal is that common. They'll take ten to swing back for ten, and it's just like, well, I block ten. Yeah. I'm now up ten health. You better hope your hand. And you, you've got you've got blind hands mm -hmm. until they fizzle, and they always will. Yeah. And so you better hope your next hand is miraculously a 22 damage hand, which it never... A five card hands is the name of flesh and blood. Yeah. So when you cash out your five card hand to do very little, and then you're on four card hands, you're just never going to win that exchange. Yeah. So as, as weird as it is, it's true. The hardest thing in poker is knowing when to fold. Because when you've got the excitement and you're like, ah, oh, this might win, yeah. I would say really think about only betting on hands that you know are going to win. And it's, it's just so much like poker, honestly. Even thinking about, you have a lot of bad hands in a row, you're kind of getting tired of not playing, not being in the game, not being able to make the bets. You get your first like pocket aces, mm -hmm. and you're like ride or die on that hand. <laughs> yeah. And then it flips, and it's like, there's no aces, there's no suits that match the suits that you're in. Mm -hmm. It's just, there's nothing. This and, didn't work out. Yeah, it's like a four, five, or yeah, let's say a five, six, seven flips. And it's mm -hmm. like, and they're all clubs, and you don't have clubs. That's such a hazardous hand. Right. Like, it looked good, but it's time to get out. Yeah, you're out. And then the next one flips, and it's like an eight. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. you could get beat by straights. You could get beat by flushes. You could get <laughs> yeah. beat by a pocket fours. I mean, it just, the list goes on and on. Uh, and so understanding, uh, and, and I think it's hard harder to appreciate, right? It's a, in poker, there's a fixed deck that everyone's playing from. In this game, you don't know what's in your opponent's hand. You don't even know what's in their deck. And little things like uh, when you had that soul shield in Arsenal, how am I to know? Right. Right. It, let's say, let's just assume I know you have six defense reactions in there. It's like, okay, well, we've seen ten cards. You've probably, if you haven't played any, you probably have one defense reaction somewhere. Yeah. And it's like, so that's pretty good odds it's in Arsenal. Yeah. So that is not the time to Crippling Crush. Yeah. Like, ideally, you pitch Crippling Crush later after they've used all their defense reactions. And then it's there for you. All right, really now bad. we got this stack of blues with an occasional crippling crush. That's when you want to be using that as Bravo. Yeah, it's amazing. So that's that's essentially just kind of a primer on tempo. It's not perfect. Um, there's a lot of different ways to think about the concept. But you know, as you play the game more, I think the more you can see each hand as its own individual kind of institution, right? <laughs> like. Is this something worth betting on, or is this a fine hand, or is this a low hand? And you take that knowledge, and then you say, okay, I, I kind of, this is a fine hand to fold, but then your opponent does three. And you're like, okay, well, I can definitely play this now. I can bet this hand, yeah. But then let's you know, say your opponent does 15, it's like, okay, I'll fold this. That's sort of like your opponent checking in poker, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, yeah, I mean, I'll no, see I'll the play. next card. No, I'll play, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, so, combination, just think about it a combination of, What's your opponent forcing you to bet in terms of health? And then what is your intended payout if you do go in on that bet? Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. That's the game we play. Uh, but over the course of the game, if you keep making good bets, That's what they will pay say, out. Right? So you, you have to know what you're betting on. And if you consistently make good bets, you'll consistently win games. That's right. Well, hey, thank you so much for joining us. Another Fat Foundations video. we got tons of topics to talk about. It just doesn't end with this game. Uh, so we've been using our Majestic products here on the table. You can find those on our website. We've got some sweet uh, dice boards here and then various tokens to track resources and those kinds of things activated and, and armor tokens. Um, and we've got all sorts of offerings on our website. We've got subscriptions. We've got a fab armory discord league. That's all going to roll after this video. And we've also got singles. We've got the whole thing. And our um, Tuesday fab streams. It's so good. Right. Yeah, Come join us out. on Tuesday. Come hang out. And we'll see you on the next video.